Distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the first uh, panel discussion at the uh, Business BSF. The title is Interconnecting uh, Southeast Europe. We are going to debate the subject uh, that is uh, dominating uh, the debate in uh, Europe at the moment, the infrastructure, including energy, of course. Uh, we have an interesting panel, Professor Leonid Grigoriev is Chief Advisor and Head of uh, Analysis Center at the Government of uh, the Russian Federation. Mr. Uh, Yanis Kopach uh, is, is the Director of the Energy Community Secretariat in Vienna. Elena Kuzmanowska, the State Secretary at the Ministry of Transport and Communication in Macedonia. Jean-Marc Peterschmidt, Managing Director responsible for Central and Southeast Eastern Europe at the <coughs> EBRD. Dr. Frank Jürgen Richter is the chairman of Horasis. Horasis is the Global Visions Community, an independent international organization committed to enacting visions for the sustainable future. Mr. Janis Krabets is one of the most known and respected Slovenian managers. He's the CEO of RICO, the largest civil engineering uh, company in Slovenia. They are carrying out many demanding construction projects in the countries of the former Soviet Union and in the Balkans. Before we start uh, the discussion, uh, I would like to briefly make some comments uh, concerning the subject. Uh, obviously, the, the issue of energy is a strong priority in Europe, in the climate and energy policy framework. The European Commission proposes a strict uh, target of reducing emissions uh, and an increase of the share of the renewable energy. Energy transition in uh, Germany, uh, so-called Energiewende, is a major switch, a switch uh, to renewable energy. It is widely seen as a as a revolutionary project. Uh, shale uh, gas uh, might become uh, a game changer worldwide, but you know, we don't know. The Western Balkans, a region that largely depends on fossil energy sources, especially coal, has to address many uh, challenges. The question how to encourage the regional cooperation and to attract necessary investment uh, in the infrastructure will be I suppose one of the main points of today's uh, discussion. Some big projects of common interest, including pipelines, are being uh, already prepared. As we have heard before, uh, the EIB and the EBRD are planning some uh, big investment uh, in the region. Surely we, we cannot avoid the impact of the Ukrainian crisis. There is a lot uh, at stake. Uh, the EU is stepping up uh, the gear to reduce energy dependency, especially with uh, Russia. Key terms are energy union, diversification, energy efficiency, interconnection, solidarity, gas imports from North America, and so on. Uh, Gazprom's uh, South Stream, uh, one of the biggest planned uh, investment in the region, there seems to hang a question mark over uh, its future. Uh, Professor Grigoriev, uh, which long-term impact will have uh, the ongoing Ukrainian-Russian crisis on the Russian relations with the EU, especially in the, in the energy sector? Uh, well, uh, I am not a politician and not a lawyer. As an economist, uh, my, my point, our point of view is pretty simple. If it's not Ukrainian uh, situation, you would never heard about the gas problem because Gazprom delivers gas and nothing else. And the problem, it's the only Ukrainian problem how to push this gas to Europe. Uh, advocates for Yav South Stream normally say uh, why you would like to have delivery of gas from Russia to Europe, where a uh, country which always in political crisis. Uh, Russia produces 10% of global energy. It's four times more than our GDP population. Half of this energy we consume ourselves, and half we deliver to Europe, mostly to Europe, very little uh, so far to China and Japan. And um, probably we deliver to Europe on consumption level, probably to Germany consumptions, to annual consumptions of Germany. 
Uh, it's mostly oil, nuclear materials, coal. Uh, gas is not the exactly, it's po just political symbol. We deliver m much more energy by all other sources. And as a normal economist, I would pr just isolate gas delivery from political troubles. On high political level and on probably it would mean South Stream instead of substantial mm, uh, transit on Ukraine. Um, uh, in the short run, I don't see any major travel for Europe on the Russian side, except uh, that on biopolitical sanctions, we developing certain projects or financing as well will be delayed. Uh, in practice, it's too early. All these stories too short, it's just a few weeks old. Uh, let's see, pro probably it's premature to see any major trouble in energy, in energy sphere. Russia will be not doing anything wrong in terms of deliveries. I don't see any problem on that side. Mm -hmm. But uh, many, but uh, many countries, uh, your neighbor countries, they have impressions that uh, that Russia is using uh, the energy as a political tool. Uh, how do you answer well, uh, well, there is an old uh, normative saying, you cannot prove negative. You cannot prove negative. Uh, I was writing, I published a chapter in Paris uh, five, three, four, five years ago. And my point was very simple. High prices for gas, high commercial prices are commercial. Low prices are political. As soon as low political prices for certain countries disappeared, it, prices came up, uh, it, it, it became a political problem for Russia. Uh, so far, so far, uh, all attempts uh, to say that Russia using the political tool, it's mostly emotions and uh, people so much believe in it that we don't even uh, take pain of proving it. It's obvious, Russians using it. Now, why, uh, where, uh, we have a Ukrainian crisis. Russia is using any weapon, gas, energy, nothing happens. We just deliver. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kupac, we still uh, remember the winter uh, 2009 when a payment dispute between Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine uh, left Bulgaria, Serbia, Macedonia uh, without Yes, this shows basically the vulnerability of several EU countries as they depend only on one gas uh, supplier. Is Europe better prepared for the possible interruptions uh, this year? Europe is uh, definitely much better prepared than it was in 2009. Um, first, because uh, very many EU countries uh, built reverse flows during that time. For example, Austria built three of them. Uh, Poland built four of them, uh, so on. almost every EU member state uh, tried to build some, uh, build some reverse flows, even Slovenia, for example, in Aydoshchina, uh, built reverse flows um, which enable uh, better or much better flexibility uh, in the case of uh, gas crisis. Um, so I believe EU will not have a major problem this year, but some uh, members, uh, some countries especially energy community member states like uh, Macedonia, Serbia, uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina through Serbia uh, are very vulnerable. Um, and this is the reason why EU inside itself and we in energy community organized so-called stress tests, uh, which were finalized right yesterday. Uh, and will be analyzed and discussed uh, in next days, um, uh, latest on Ministerial Council of Energy Community on 23rd of September in Kiev. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, I can't promise or guarantee that there will no, be no problems in case of uh, this um, interruption of the gas supply, but I can prove something else or I can guarantee something else. Um, uh, this year, the situation in Ukraine is completely different as it was in 2009. In 2009, there were several disputes uh, between Russia and Ukraine, who is stealing gas, who is uh, uh, keeping it for himself, who is not sending it. 
This year, the uh, Ukrainian uh, transmission system operator, Naftogaz, uh, is every day promptly uh, showing on internet, every, everybody can see exact amounts of gas, where it is coming in the country, where it is kept, uh, how it goes towards the West. So Ukraine in this year is very, very transparent and very, very fair uh, and uh, uh, reliable partner in gas transit. Uh, what was not the case in 2009. So I believe if there, okay, I cannot uh, exclude uh, some Wiesmeyer, um, but uh, I believe uh, that if Russia will respect uh, its um, uh, um, obligations, uh, commercial obligations, there will be no disruption uh, because of Ukraine. At least now it shows like that. And the second thing, perhaps, um, um, if I can uh, uh, somehow reply on, on, uh, on one statement of a professor from earlier, gas prices are uh, really used as a weapon. Not political, sometimes also political, but as a commercial weapon uh, as well. If we look, Gazprom is now for the second year um, publishing gas prices um, in uh, different uh, um, um, final uh, customers, countries. And we can see that the highest price for, for Russian gas is uh, pays Macedonia and Ukraine. Uh, Macedonia, I think, is paying $490 per 1,000 cubic meters. The same gas in Great Britain, because also Great Britain is buying some, some gas from Gazprom, is approximately $260 per 1,000 cubic meters. In Slovenia, it is around 380. For example, in, in Germany, it is around 330, 340. So uh, more we are going towards West, cheaper the Russian gas is. And this is because of competition. Uh, on, in Western Europe, there is plenty of competition for gas. And sometimes I make joke, uh, jokes that if the Russian gas would be sold to, further towards West, let's say New York, it would be for free. Um, but uh, 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 despite transportation costs are of course bigger and bigger to where more you go towards West. So uh, uh, enabling better infrastructure, enabling more competition uh, inside EU and in energy community uh, member states is the only proper answer on potential gas crisis and I think the only sustainable, long-lasting um, uh, settlement of, of the gas uh, market, uh, not only for EU but also for uh, Russia and Gazprom. Uh, Just very shortly. Eh? I, I will not dispute. Uh, uh, it's fine. Uh, what everything is fine. Uh, two just short comments. Uh, well. New York for free is exaggeration. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but on the Ukrainian situation, there is one, uh, unfortunately, there is one difficult point because for supplying European winter, uh, it's necessary about 20 BCM in Ukrainian storages. And we confirm we need to, pay, uh, to buy about 5 BCM uh, additional gas now before winter. We don't do it because it costs money. We don't pay us for our debt. I'm, I'm pretty happy about the situation to Europe. In 2009, I was in Kyiv on TV discussing all these problems. That was a mess. Uh, now, at least European supplies, I saw it. But we don't know if we would be able to add to supply from Ukrainian storage because we are not doing uh, stockpiling now. I presume Gazprom is buying uh, storage capacities all around Europe to deliver, but it would be around uh, Ukraine, not through Ukraine. So uh, we can't have a system of what, how we see the technical and economic situation is, is much more complicated. Thank you. Mrs. Kuzmanowska, how do you see the situation regarding the gas supply? What does the secure supply of gas mean? Uh, for your country, so. 
Uh, well, we are one of the countries that uh, have to develop a uh, gas distribution network and increase the consumption in the following years. So our consumption levels are relatively small and maybe this affects the, the level of prices the, that we are getting from the suppliers. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's a situation where we cannot look only at one issue. Uh, we are a small country and we are dependent on all decisions that are happening in the uh, gas initiatives in the region. So everything uh, we do, we must take into consideration every uh, happening in our surround surroundings and further. Uh, while on one hand we need to construct uh, the infrastructure and uh, we are negotiating with uh, EBRD for a loan to develop the entire national infrastructure, we are trying to increase the consumption by uh, publishing uh, calls for a distribution network within the cities because so far household consumption is, uh, is non-existent in Macedonia. We have only three cities connected to the existing line and uh, I think annually between 100 and 130 million cubic meters are consumed. So while doing this we have to see which uh, regional initiative is moving fastest. So far it was uh, the South Stream and it was uh, very uh, expected from us to, to speak uh, how to connect to, to this uh, regional gas pipeline. Uh, nevertheless, all our strategic documents uh, have foreseen every single possible uh, initiative that, that can happen in our surroundings. So our distribution network is designed in such a way that uh, if uh, there is possibility and need and depending on the best uh, conditions that we will receive, we can connect either to Serbia or to two points in Bulgaria. One is existent, one is uh, down to Petrich, which will connect us to either existing or newly constructed uh, gas lines. Uh, in Bulgaria, two connections to Greece and uh, potentially one to Albania if some of the regional initiatives happen. In parallel to this, we need to also think about increasing the consumption in the power generation plants uh, of gas. And um, to be honest, it's rather difficult process to, to handle all the issues at the same time, uh, to trying to make the right choice. And uh, our only goal is to secure as soon as possible uh, gas consumption within the households, the industry and the power generation plants and to achieve it on most reasonable uh, sources, having in mind that we might not be a major player in the region and this is clearly an example how, how we depend on uh, cooperation between our partners and uh, the trust here definitely plays a big issue. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skrabets, for you, uh, as a manager, I suppose the worsening of the EU-Russia relations uh, war in Ukraine uh, and the sanctions spiral is like a nightmare. Uh, could you say that projects, including yours in uh, Russia, in Ukraine, are endangered? First of all, I would like to say I am very against the sanctions. You know, I think that it's a very bad solution. Um, just one reason, you know, if we believe that international trade, international exchange is a win-win situation, then we have to admit that uh, if you don't trade, then it's a loose, loose situation, you know, and both sides are lo losing, you know. I don't know, I'm not going to say who more. Second, uh, could we do different, you know? I think the, the most important question is where is it going? Where is it headed, uh, heading, you know? Are we going to those sanctions avoid, let's say, the war, uh, 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 to get peace faster, or is it leading to the battlefield, you know? And I'm not the only one. I, the other day I just read a very interesting article of Gabor Steingart. He is the German journalist in Handelsblatt, and he, his article was the t titled The West on the Wrong Way, way. and I'm, I'm sure that we are on the wrong way. Could we act different, you know? He pointed out very interesting similarity, you know, uh, when in Berlin, 
you faced, Berliner faced the, the wall, you know, when the, the Eastern Germans uh, started to build. What did, at that time, big leader Willy Brandt did? He didn't act like this, you know. He didn't start any sanction, although he was sometimes forced to do it, you know. And I'm, I, I'm, I see today we don't have in Europe so big leaders as Willy Brandt was at that time, you know, unfortunately. So the question, we entrepreneurs, we have to see in the problems opportunities and not, opportuni uh, not, the, that, not that the opportunities are the problems, you know. Fortunately, our strategy was always we don't go just to the Russia, we have to cover the whole ex-USSR since we have some advantages, you know. If you, uh, for example, we are very active in, in uh, Belarus, we are very active in Ukraine, Moldavia, etc., etc. And if you have this combination, I think that then you have much more, more opportunities. And I see right now in Belarus where we are act, acting uh, a lot, where we are very, very active, uh, that, uh, and we are in the investment industry, very high growth in demanding uh, as far as the food industry is concerned, you know, meat, diary, you know, beverages, you know, since they cannot get, uh, the Russians are not, not getting the, the meat, the diary products from uh, Western Europe. And I think here, if something we are losing in Russia, we are gaining in Belarus. Another story, uh, the other day from Ukraine, uh, there were uh, from Uker, from Energo, people were in Slovenia. We are doing in Belarus trans transformation station, for example, you know. We w were not able to come to enter the U Ukraine because in uh, Zaporozhye was very strong transform uh, uh, factory for transformations but in the hands of the Russians, you know. Now, they came to us because they don't want to work anymore with this company and um, offering us that we would repla replace them. So I think that enter we entrepreneurs, despite all those foolish <laughs> acts that our politicians are doing, we have to behave pragmatic and we have to find opportunities even in those very difficult times. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peter Schmidt, in the EU we have consensus on reducing dependence on uh, Russian gas. Do you see in this context any new window of, window of, of opportunity for the Balkan countries to receive more uh, financial aid or loans for the investment in the energy infrastructure, energy efficiency, renewable energy resources? Actually, um, energy is a very large part of what the EBRD is financing in this, in this region. It's about a quarter of our portfolio. It's about a quarter of the annual flows of uh, monies that are coming to uh, the Southeastern Europe uh, region. And this recognizes that um, it is needed first because we have a broader sustainable energy and climate change mandate, and I think that's important, and that has consequences on what you need to invest in. It is needed because business want to have continuity of supply, but they also want to have uh, well, uh, competitively priced uh, supply. But there, that, that is supply, but they can also act on, on uh, demand and, and efficiency. And it's uh, needed for the everyday uh, well-being of, uh, of the population. So I'd like to just break it down and step back a little bit in, you know, there's everything you can do on the demand side and then there are things you can do on the, on the supply side. And as a, having a sustainable energy mandate, you want to act on both sides. On the demand side, Central and Eastern Europe is about three times less efficient than the European Union countries as a whole. So it takes three times more energy to produce a unit of GDP, if you want, energy intensity, than, uh, than you have it elsewhere in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. So before we start talking about energy security and energy diversification, let's consume less energy. And that is, it's a no-brainer because 
it's a quick winner for those who invest in this, whether they are households, whether they are businesses, or whether they are public entities, uh, public buildings, uh, schools, hospitals, things like that. It pays back very quickly. It's a winner for the country because the country becomes less dependent on whatever energy sources uh, they are using or importing. And it's a winner for the planet because you're rejecting less carbon. That is one focus of what the EBRD is trying to do more generally, but in this region in particular. Then on the supply side, we started hearing a lot and maybe a little bit focused on, on, on the gas situation. But on the supply side, what you hear today is countries want to have relative security of supply. That means diversifications. That means integration, because it's about building options. It's about getting flexibility. It's about not necessarily owning and building new physical production assets, but perhaps just trading. And that, again, makes eminent sense because today you look at Bulgaria, there is excess electricity production capacity. You talk to other countries in this region and the talk is about building new capacity. Well, maybe what we need to build here is new transmission lines and have more trading of uh, electricity in, in, this, um, in this region. Diversification also is about uh, renewables, and there you go back to the, to the climate change uh, agenda. It's about hydro, it's about wind, it's about solar, but you have to do it in the right framework because very easy for this to run out of, uh, of, uh, of support and become effectively uh, uneconomic and un unsustainable. But all of these are part of the EBRD's agenda in this region, and as I say, very high uh, on our agenda. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richter, in the context of uh, Ukrainian uh, crisis, uh, does Europe need a new paradigm uh, in relations with Russia? Namely, going back to business as usual seems to be impossible. Quite a philosophic question, Peter. And um, I should maybe start with saying that I'm sitting here on the extreme right, maybe in your eyes on the extreme left, but uh, I'm based in Switzerland, so we try to go for the middle way, and maybe that's what we need, ladies and gentlemen, right now. It's a very intense debate, and um, actually it's the first time here at the platform we're talking about Russia. We talked a lot about trust yesterday, we talked about reconnecting Europe, we talked about how to steer a new dialogue, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I open the newspapers every day, I'm quite concerned, because the current state of the world seems to be quite gloomy. There's a lot of finger pointing, and maybe uh, you heard about uh, um, Italian philosopher Machiavelli, who lived in the 16th century, quite nearby in northern Italy. He was basically saying that the means, um, or basically uh, saying you, you use power and uh, you point fingers and uh, the end justifies the means. And this may be what's happening right now. And um, Professor Grigorov, you mentioned before that, and uh, I try to um, interpret in a way um, uh, the positive statement. Uh, I guess it's uh, real politic that in a way nothing is changing and everything will go on. Russia will not stop the gas supply. And um, uh, I hope to share this view, but um, in um, practical terms, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are really facing a big crisis. We are commemorating the 100th um, anniversary of the um, outbreak of the First World War, and uh, just 100 years ago, we faced actually quite a similar situation. Finger pointing, uh, powers just saying, you know, we are not moving, we are putting red line, and suddenly something is happening, and it's a very, very dangerous situation. Maybe, and Janesh would like to comment on your view as an entrepreneur, we need uh, to be pragmatic. Maybe entrepreneurs should lead the way and sit together with politicians, and uh, in a way, leave away all ideology uh, and what we read every day in the media and try to be pragmatic, really pragmatically, trying to solve this conflict through dialogue. And maybe coming to the Ukrainian crisis, as it's a quite uh, you know, down-to-earth panel, we can say whatever we want. Uh, we want to try to face a situation. What maybe we should do is to get everybody on one table, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Putin, 
um, the American president, the European leaders, uh, and of course Ukraine itself, and see what uh, kind of compromise could we go for. Maybe um, trying to preserve the identity of the Ukraine, but still maybe giving some uh, independence or some sort of, um, you know, uh, maybe in terms of economic policy, in terms of uh, regional agenda, sometimes of uh, some uh, uh, sort of independence uh, to parts of the country, but preserving the national identity of the country. So uh, trying to find a solution through dialogue. Coming to the region, and if you're talking about um, Southeast Europe, um, here, uh, um, actually, we are facing a similar situation of finger-pointing. Just, um, you know, um, 20 years ago, um, if you look on the, the map, you know, there have been much less countries. And what we see um, uh, in Europe now, that many countries go for independence, maybe Scotland uh, will join the process I call Balkanization of Europe, where everybody goes to smaller parts, maybe in Spain, maybe in Belgium, even maybe in Switzerland on the long term. We have four national languages, which I guess will not happen. But um, uh, in this context, maybe uh, the term of globalization and the concept of globalization comes to an end. Maybe, you know, uh, Francis Fukuyama's theory of uh, the end of history uh, 20 years ago saying, you know, the, uh, the capitalism, the free world, uh, globalization is um, uh, on the winning side. And, uh, you know, we can't go back in history. But maybe, you know, the whole concept of globalization is being challenged. And what we maybe might need here in the region is a new concept uh, of collaboration where all of you, uh, the whole of Southeast Europe, sit together again. There was an initiative last week when the leaders of Southeast Europe met the leaders um, uh, in, uh, in Brussels, uh, including in Berlin. It was in Berlin. Uh, it was Angela Merkel hosting uh, the summit, which was quite an uh, important um, initiative. And uh, I think maybe this new regional spirit, that's what we need. And maybe just give up on Machiavelli and try to find uh, a new concept of dialogue. Frank Jürgen, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Rigoryev, from the Ukrainian uh, point of view, uh, is the project South Stream uh, largely designed to exert pressure uh, on Ukraine? In contrast, uh, in Southeast Europe, uh, it is perceived positively as the strategic investment with uh, positive long-term effects. Uh, how do you see the prospects of the South Stream in new uh, circumstances? How do you see this European or debate? Uh, well, uh, all Russian new pipelines to Europe were invented before the Great Recession. Uh, this audience, six years ago, in early 2008, would ask me a completely different question. And I did it for years before the recession. Are you Russian investing enough to supply additional 100 or 200 BCM to the current contracts? So we put money in the new development in the pipeline projects. Here a recession comes, and uh, the uh, Eurozone in the zero group for years, and a European consumption of gas down for two reasons. One is a recession, uh, another is switching from gas to coal, and substantial switching to, to coal. And carbon price is down, and if uh, in next three years, uh, hopefully Europe would go up on some economic growth from zero to say 1% or even 2%, plus carbon price up, and switching back from coal to gas, you will need gas. You, know, you, you in this case, the whole European Union. Uh, so Russians are taking, uh, Russians, well, I follow the kind of wrong way, uh, Gazprom. I'm not saying for Russians or for Russian state. Gazprom is taking the com huge commercial risk to build a pipeline which was designed for additional supply originally. Uh, and the same uh, basically for Nord Stream. Uh, Nord Stream was, uh, pro, uh, was under the fire for a couple of years. After that, everything is fine. Nobody remembers uh, how many stupidities were said about Nord Stream. It works. Uh, in five, six years, we probably will be here discussing how good the South Stream for Balkans, because Serbia, uh, Hungary, and Bulgaria basically need it for development. Austria can 
live, <laughs> live <laughs> happily. But basically, and Slovenia potentially, if say second pipe could be delivered through, you know, to Italy, second pipe gas. Uh, so it, it, this project is clear. Ukraine is just a transit country. We don't make too much money on this transit because transit fee is about, it's a fixed full cost, uh, basically must be spent uh, for repair and technical gas. It's not an income for the budget. Um, 85 BCM, we, we make out a few, few billion dollars, must be spent for repair of the pipeline. So it's not basically a big deal. If country uh, reached, uh, after 25 years of transition, uh, has a GDP per capita $3,000, three, four times less than Hungary, Tur uh, than Romania, Turkey, uh, four times, um, four and five or six times in Slovenia, it's not a problem of pipeline. We must do something else to make uh, GDP growing. It's not, it, we don't depend on these pipelines. It's a political influence. Yes, uh, just we can block it. And uh, let me, one small remark to Mr. Richter. That's exactly what I said. Uh, nobody, wa nobody takes pair, pain to prove that Russia is doing or may doing something wrong. But let me quote you. Russia will not stop the gas supply. What's the problem? It never was the problem. We just uh, supply. If you mean 2009, that was stopped to Ukraine, not to Europe. And right now, we stop to Ukraine, and we clear enough, thanks God, not to uh, block the supply. At that time, we make the reverse by the same uh, export pipelines. And PR was completely terrible on Russian side, and displaying the switching off. But so you're right, Professor, even during the Cold War, Russia never stopped uh, the gas supply. But it would be very- Ukraine. No, I think Russia never stopped the gas supply during the Cold War. But I would never be, um, go so far just to analyze the future by looking back into the past and say, you know, what happened in the past wouldn't maybe be a security for the future. I would yeah, be very fine, cautious fine. Uh, on that one. Fine, fine. but uh, what I mean, people so much used to have Russia as an offender in mind, that even uh, way of speech betrays this common attitude. Oh, that's good. Russia will not stop supply. Russia will never stop supply if it's not prevented from supplying. It's not a question to discuss. Uh, the issue is, uh, back to the Ukrainian case, uh, let's imagine the ultimate case. South Stream built, uh, no gas or, or very little gas goes from Ukrainian pipes to Europe. Europe will never notice it. Just never notice it. It's not a problem for Europe at all. What does it mean, pressure on Ukraine? To do what? Uh, we will lose uh, some uh, assets. We, you just uh, quoted how we are losing the assets. We will not be supplied but uh, some stations from Zaporozhye Russian enterprise. Fine. So it adds to manufacturing decline on Ukraine. By the way, not quite clear how we are going to pay for you, for your supply, if you are not producing anything at home. The um, July number is a minus 12% of, on industrial production. Um, I think GDP in Ukraine this year is minus 10%. Official numbers, Ukrainian numbers minus minus six. EBRD, our sources give about minus seven, minus eight. Without counting V4, it's gonna be minus 10. If country is not producing, how it's paying? How it's developing. Uh, let's imagine no crisis on Ukraine this year, just normal economy. Uh, to reach Poland in 2030, 2030, Poland, saying Poland is growing three and a half, three and a half percent is before, is recently years. Ukraine would need 8.5 percent growth for 17 years. Uh, it's not the case already because it's minus 10. We are talking about very difficult economic situation in Ukraine. And uh, what basically Russian economists, not government, economists, were telling Ukrainians and Europeans that 
the only way for Ukraine to stay well-developed country is to sell to two markets, European and Russian, because we were buying everything sophisticated. Europe is not. To keep uh, any level of sophisticated industrial of manufacturing in U Ukraine, it's, 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 it's exp exporting to Russia. Otherwise, it's just impossible. Uh, so gas pipeline is completely artificial case to discuss on Ukraine at all. It's a special political case created by politicians. It has nothing to do with economy. It, it doesn't create Ukrainian economy. It, uh, and Ukrainian economy will live without pipelines, uh, transit pipelines. It's not a problem for the whole Europe, the whole world to discuss Ukrainian pipelines. Deliver and, and forget it. Uh, if, you, uh, for, if it creates the trouble, if it's creates the trouble, okay, we go other ways, one or another way. So for, from, <laughs> from, uh, from professional uh, side, it's not, it's not a problem. It's strictly political we are trying to avoid. And the more politics in Ukraine, the less Ukrainian development. Okay, I think we have to admit that uh, the energy is not only an economic good, it is also part of the security. Mr. Kopach, uh, regarding uh, the South Stream, uh, what do you think, what is the, the, the main problem? Uh, EU legislation or maybe uh, politics? Uh, South Stream is, uh, has always been a welcome project even in EU, uh, but only if it would follow uh, the EU legislation or so-called third energy package, what means uh, that every pipeline that is built has to be offered on a so-called free season to every potential user that the tariffs have, have to be established by independent energy regulator that is, exists in every EU uh, member state, uh, and uh, that uh, the producer or the, the trader of gas uh, cannot be more than 50% owner of such a uh, uh, gas pipeline. Uh, this uh, uh, th so-called third energy package was adopted just to prevent uh, competition inside EU. And uh, I have to say that I don't understand Russians or, or Gazprom, because in case of Slovenia, we negotiated uh, an intergovernmental agreement that follows the third energy package. And this was the first case ever that Russia, in, as a state, admitted or recognized the third energy package. And then they copied this and they uh, repeated it in the intergovernmental agreement with the Republic of Austria. In all other EU member states and energy community member states, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Serbia, Greece, uh, intergovernmental agreements are opposite, are, are not in line with uh, uh, so-called third energy package. And Russia, of course, insists on not respecting uh, so-called third energy package. Uh, the reason I can only imagine, the region is, could be kind of an imperial. They want to have uh, an exemption forever because European uh, Union allows exemption for investors. And for example, just to tell you one example with which I'm familiar because uh, we as Energy Community Secretariat approved uh, an exemption. It is TAP, Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, that should go from, um, through, uh, from Azerbaijan, through Georgia, Turkey, uh, Greece, Albania, to southern Italy for approximately 10 billion cubic meters, what is uh, approximately the same amount or the same quantity or the same volume as it was in, uh, initially planned for South Stream uh, through Slovenia towards northern Italy. Uh, investors asked for an exemption because they said we need a monopoly uh, uh, to return our investment and we said okay but they had to to prove this uh, need for an exemption and they got an exemption for 15 years <coughs> uh, and so for 15 years they can keep monopoly but Gazprom would like to keep an exemption for 100 years not for 15 only 
And I'm completely sure that if Gazprom would ask officially for such an exemption, it would get it in a month or two. Even now, despite the Ukrainian-Russian crisis, but Gazprom doesn't want to ask to respect European legislation because they, they, have, they want an exemption forever. Um, I, or I can only imagine that this is the reason. So uh, South Stream, uh, I believe, is a very realistic project, not for Slovenia at all, but uh, uh, to come into Europe, but only respecting the EU legislation. Otherwise, uh, I'm completely sure the European Commission will be very strict against Bulgaria or any other entry point on the territory of European Union. And saying uh, something about South Stream and Ukraine, um, transit uh, income uh, from existing uh, transit of Russian gas through Ukraine towards European Union is very important income for Ukraine. So it's an economic question as well. It's true that Ukrainians were very bad in, in, in keeping this gas pipeline in a good condition in the past. Now the things are, because they used this income from transit mostly for subsidies for their own uh, industry and uh, ho uh, households. Um, but now they adopted a new law just uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, which allows foreign investment into their gas pipeline, what has been a problem for the last 10 years, a big political problem in Ukraine. And uh, they, they stated in this law that every country, company that is based in EU or in energy community member states can become 49% owner or co-owner of this um, um, gas pipelines. And for example, Naftna Industria Serbia, which is in ownership of uh, Gazprom or majority ownership of Gazprom, could, for example, become 49% owner, because Serbia is a member of energy community, uh, could become uh, uh, an, a co-owner of uh, um, uh, gas pipelines, uh, transit gas pipelines through Ukraine. But of course, uh, uh, having uh, gas pipelines on your territory is kind of a strategic position. And there are bigger games uh, which are not related with gas supply, with commercial issues, but with, I believe, uh, long-lasting uh, uh, political strategy. Um, so gas uh, South Stream has always been a geostrategic uh, project, uh, never very, very economically proved. Uh, but uh, uh, doesn't matter, even uh, Nord Stream was uh, not economically proved, but on a long period, I believe it will, that the investment will return. Uh, and Russia is a big country and Gazprom is a big company and they can wait on, uh, on this long term. Um, th this is the fact. Uh, so South Stream is very possible, but, uh, respecting EU legal uh, framework. Mr. Peter Schmidt, uh, we know infrastructure and investments in general are key to growth and prosperity, but uh, sometimes it is, uh, it is not so easy to figure out uh, what to invest in, uh, what should be a priority in the, Balkan, in the Balkans, especially because of the fact that, that governments do not have enough money even to uh, co-finance uh, the international uh, projects. Uh, f furthermore, the region has not be been able to realize, realize on its own any uh, big transboundary project. Okay, so again, it's about uh, integration and, and, and regional cooperation. And, uh, uh, the, the, the countries of Southeast Europe are too small to simply envisage agenda on their own. Yet, by default, that is still too often what, what happens. So the first thing is you need uh, real political willingness and, and leadership to go and, and, and tackle a set of priority projects together. That is what's happening when prime ministers go to Germany as they did last week or when they come to EBRD as they did last uh, February and that is something that we keep have to keep going. 
Secondly, there needs to be an agreement on, on what truly are the priorities. It cannot be that we want to build every road, every motorway, every port, and every power station at the same time. Nobody can afford it. And a piece of motorway here and a, a piece of motorway there doesn't constitute any, any benefit for the region. There are venues for this, the Western Balkan investment framework under the auspices of the EU in particular, is one place where countries, IFIs, sit together to decide what are the priorities and are these projects truly feasible. Which takes me to the third step. It's about preparing and sizing them correctly. There are too many dreams of white elephants uh, all over the place. And uh, there's nothing wrong with thinking big uh, in the long term, but uh, one needs to keep uh, you know, something that is modular, something that you can build up uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in stages. You then need to think about the finance properly. And uh, many of these projects are sitting on government balance sheets. They are public uh, projects and I think we can there is necessarily a constraint because there's also a need to have a prudent fiscal uh, management. You cannot run your debt to GDP uh, um, uh, without a due consideration for, for uh, the soundness of your, of your government uh, balance sheet. So there's a need to think how can you build infrastructure and energy away from the public sector? How can you commercialize the companies uh, they might still be public companies, but instead of doing it with a government sovereign guarantee, you do it as a commercial loan on the corporate balance sheet of a road, a motorway company, or an electricity company. Or you do PPPs, and I'm not a private sector zealot in this because PPPs are difficult, they're expensive, and they don't always work, but there are a few projects in this region where you could actually mobilize a private sector. And then last thing, I think we don't pay enough attention to the governance aspects of, uh, of doing infrastructure properly. You heard it from uh, the two IFI presidents uh, today. Uh, proper procurement and, and effective value for the, the, the works and, and, and the quality offered is, is essential. I'm a little bit uh, worried when I see companies coming or countries sometimes with bilaterally agreed grant projects that haven't been properly searched, that haven't been properly tendered. They may look good on the face of it, uh, but there may also be you know, costs lurking uh, in the back that, that have not been uh, taken care of. So this is not, so I, I've said very little about physical assets, but more about the process that can bring together more effective and, and uh, uh, better thought out infrastructure development in, uh, in Southeast Europe where it is evidently a huge uh, priority. So thank you. Uh, Ms. Kuzmanowska, uh, what your uh, country actually uh, expects from the IFI's international financial institutions? Do they do they understand, uh, really, your needs? We basically expect them to fulfill our wishes for the white elephants, <laughs> as mm -hmm. the representative from UBRD said. Um, no, generally, we expect them to, to recognize the needs uh, for the projects that we are proposing. And uh, so far, we, we managed always to, to find a common ground and common solution to, to identify the projects that need to be financed uh, in priority. This is one of the major issues that uh, governments face, especially governments of countries that uh, are still not uh, members of the European Union and don't have access to, to European funds for infrastructure. So we basically, we are uh, relying on IFIs and uh, generally these are loans 
and um, you know our uh, because we are all smaller countries now in the region that we are looking at we have limited uh, budget spaces uh, and we have uh, huge needs for infrastructure projects not just energy infrastructure but uh, transport in infrastructure as well so the main compromise is to to adjust the the needs the priority of the needs and uh, the size of, of each project and generally, in each project that we have discussed with uh, the IFIs, uh, the first thing that, that we are measuring is the return rate, economic rate of return, the financial rate of return, and they always uh, double check the, the market analysis that, uh, that we are proposing to them in our studies, and of course the, the cost uh, forecasts, because uh, usually uh, these are the major risks uh, associated with, with huge uh, infrastructure projects. So we as governments usually always like to, to look at a little bit brighter pictures and more optimistic scenarios, but uh, uh, in accordance with the bank, we, we always manage to, to, to find the dynamics and size of projects that, that are probably more realistic. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Skrabitz, uh, I think you have uh, a lot of experience uh, in the region. There's a lot of criticism that you know uh, uh, governance in the region is not really good. That there's a lot of uh, corruption. Uh, what is uh, your experience? Is there really are decision makers in the region really so uh, corrupted? First, I would like to connect. I'd like to connect myself to the Frank Jurgen. Uh, thesis, you know, you said that we need new, new paradigm in collaboration in this region, in the South Europe region. Uh, I would say we need just to confess that we used to live together for the last 70 years. We shouldn't forget, uh, because we wanted to neglect our history, you know. We, uh, this meeting, this uh, today, Blitz, uh, Blitz Strategic Forum is good that we are talking about the trust. But I hope that next year we are going to talk about the respect. Because I know the ex I know experience from the Slovenia. Last year, for example, at, at, at our athletics uh, uh, organization, we didn't, for the last 20 years, we didn't want it to belong to the Balkan association of athletes. We wanted to be the part of Middle Europe, of, uh, of the Western Europe. They didn't allow us to enter this part of the organization. That's why we were alone for the 20 years. Last year, with the, uh, with the agreement of our, but silent agreement of our politicians, we then entered the uh, Balkans associations. Is it respect to the Balkans, you know? That's why we have to confess that we had much more in common that we are prepared to confess, you know? Then we will be able to set the priorities to build much more rational policy as far as the infrastructure is concerned. We would be able to uh, find uh, our um, uh, where we have, uh, how many things we have in common, and we can we build then much better rational policy as far as is infrastructure is concerned, as our economy is concerned. But of course, we have to start again to respect each other. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Richter, you wrote recently. Uh, we, that we are often not aware of the importance of infrastructure. Uh, do you maybe see the danger of, the, of wrong investments? Uh, I mean, a lot of money will be spent for huge uh, projects, but at the end of the day, uh, their effects uh, may be rather moderate. Well, let me first talk about um, elephants, if I yeah, may, for yeah, a second, yeah. especially the white elephants. And um, I think we need white elephants, uh, Shomak, because we need to develop and shape the future, long-term visions, long-term strategies. Maybe the whole gas agenda is just transitional, uh, transitional for the next 20, 30 years and all the issues on the pipelines and all the challenges because we all should focus and we will focus on sustainable energy, 
uh, what Germany is doing right now. You mentioned before the, the changing of the energy uh, agenda. Uh, what's happening right now in the US with fracking? And I would even say that um, US is maybe uh, the most important um, economic engine of the future. It's maybe the uh, emerging power. It's not China, it's not India, Russia, or the Middle East, it's the US. I think we are witnessing a new growth agenda in US because US is repositioning itself on energy and a lot of new energy sources. Likewise in Europe, uh, focusing on renewables, on solar and hydro uh, and so on. Um, so talk about um, infrastructure, the question is really what is serving us uh, on the long term. And uh, we need to think about uh, our highways, about our airports, uh, and of course about the, the energy infrastructure. But uh, we should really invest where we can reap the benefits uh, on the long term. So we need white elephants, that's my uh, conclusion here. And uh, maybe we should also stop this uh, divide between the East and the West. When we talk about the conflict uh, between Russia uh, and the West these days, uh, it's always a category, Russia and the West. But is it really a difference? Are we all, uh, are, aren't we just the same? I think we're all Europeans and uh, we share the same history. And, um, you know, if you compare Russian history with Western history, I think there are some common roots, a lot of common roots. And um, I think we should maybe, and it's your point, um, Janusz, we should maybe uh, develop again the respect for each other, saying we are one big continent, and uh, we should um, develop uh, this respect and the uh, institutions we need uh, to foster this respect. So the discussion has been quite interesting uh, until now. We have, of course, time for uh, some uh, questions. Uh, gentlemen in the back. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Istvan Sobo, coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Budapest. Um, I'd like to have a very short statement and really very short, I don't want to rob your time, and one real question. I hope many answers I'm going to get, uh, get from you. The short statement is about in the last 25 years, and now I say East and West means within the European Union and also the West Balkan. That's not, not about Russia. Uh, in the last 25 years, the interconnectivity in Europe has been done East, West, West, East, which means we have the interconnection where the West could reach the markets in the East, new upcoming countries to the European Union. Second statement, if you have a look of the, for example, gas pipelines, oil pipelines, or highways, or train, track, whatever, north, south, south, north, here in the eastern side, let's say eastern central side of Europe, let's say the V4 countries, Slovenia, Croatia, whatever, almost nothing has been done. A short sidestep, 2008-2009 gas crisis, and the result, uh, the impact is that we start to make interconnections. Now this was the statement, what I said, and now the question. About the generally diversification possibilities, let's say only gas pipelines, diversification. We know diversification of road which means we choose another country that should be, for example, South Stream. We have diversification of molecules that tap what we see, something which is coming from uh, Azerbaijan, let's say, and then, or Shakhtanis, and then it's coming uh, towards to Europe, which means an, a different molecule. That's a diversification of molecule, let's say a source diversification. And the last thing should be the diversification of price. And it's a very important moment since we have been spoken about and one of you have already mentioned, the further you go to the West, the cheaper the Russian gas is, which is quite an interesting fact. Uh, my question is, what do you think about, what is more important? Diversification of road, diversification of molecules, or diversification of price, which means, I think, interconnectivity. Because once we connect all the countries around, I'm sorry, then maybe the price, Mervariah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Professor Grigoriev and Mr. Kupac, they both uh, uh, well, it's want to answer and answer. to add your... Uh, probably with it's questions were not for me. Yeah, but you want to... Uh, but I wonder. Okay. okay. In this okay. context, maybe. Yes. 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 Connect, so. Well, uh, we domestically, we always criticize Gazprom for different things. But since I'm alone here, I probably can say a couple of words about in the defense of Gazprom. Otherwise, first, by the language of this panel, uh, South Stream is a white elephant. It's the only white elephant we're really talking about in life. Uh, it has very clever head, Slovenian, and stomach and probably Serbia, uh, and can it enter the Europe? <coughs> because a lot of difficulty. It's easy to enter Europe as a small animal, but white elephant is a problem. Uh, why we don't uh, do like Slovenians is kind of an uh, interesting question. Can you imagine, put yourself for a second in the head of Miller. Okay, I will be Miller for you. I'm Miller. I'm thinking, okay, Slovenians made the perfect contract. Very good. Now, what we suggesting me? to renegotiate overnight five intergovernmental agreements with five Balkan countries. Come on, it will take how many years? You can do, can you do it overnight? And after to apply uh, to European, uh, some, sometimes hostile European Commission proving that this huge money should be paid off not in 15 years, but in something else. And Gazprom believes in two things. Uh, as far as I understand them. Uh, sometimes we don't understand them, sometimes we, we can do it. Uh, first, we have Nord Stream e exempted. Why South Stream is worse than Nord Stream? It's the same country, the same market. And second, we believe if they applied for South Stream, why night before the door was closed? So we don't want to ask for exemption in this in the situation we believe is a, it, it was a, pre uh, change, uh, change of legislation. And we believe it was made against them specifically. So that's what they say. That's not me. That's me. Well, I probably never, he never said it publicly, but Gazprom people said it many times. So why we would apply for the rules, which basically very hard to make in this case. Uh, in Slovenia, it's easy. But to, to move all this uh, uh, gas from inside Russia, via the whole Black Sea, and proving we are, I'm vital, let me in. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kupac, you wanted to add something? So we are quite pressed by time. Please, yeah, you are yeah. short uh, and concise. Okay, the question was about the diversification. Um, uh, First, I would say uh, the most proper answer is diversification of routes. Um, uh, th th I think this is the first step. And European Union uh, is trying now to answer or to, to make this first step with so-called projects of common interest, uh, PCIs, uh, inside so-called uh, program of connecting European facility, which has quite a lot of money for energy projects, five billion euros 5.1 from now till 2020 and i believe slovenia will participate or will benefit from this as well but uh, and hungary as well uh, if we talk about energy community countries which are represent here uh, we uh, also uh, before european union uh, adopted our projects of energy community interest um, so we were more advanced than european union and you can imagine how hard work this was on the territory where less than 20 hours, uh, 20 years ago, uh, still war was going on. Um, and uh, uh, we, we have perfect solution. Um, so we have regional projects, but there is no European budget behind it. <laughs> so no uh, instrument which is called connecting European facility. And I think, and I would like to persuade or to convince now European Union as well, that they have with this uh, conference in Berlin and with all other steps, they have to do something more. Um, and uh, for example, just to mention Macedonia, what, what a stupidity was made. 
a few months ago, or, or this, this weeks, uh, I can say, uh, European Union uh, or European Commission asked from Macedonia to exclude energy as an issue from IPA funds, so from IPA national strategy. And this means that Macedonia cannot get any European money uh, for, from IPA funds from now till 2020. What, what a stupidity. On one side, they are, of course, supporting projects of energy community interest and all blah, blah, energy efficiency, European EBRD and EIB are in, um, active and so on. And on, on the other side, some officials there are, are making such stupidities. But OK, I'm not going now deeper into this. So only one message, what is necessary, I believe, is uh, to enable or to transform Western Balkans investment framework, so a, 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 a financial instrument which we already have, into co-financing instrument uh, for, for infrastructure purposes. Uh, and second, what is needed is to establish a risk enhancement or risk mitigation uh, facility for uh, European neighborhood, uh, because in EU you don't have these political risks. Uh, uh, but uh, okay, now in Bulgaria with this, let's say, uh, because they are uh, decreasing uh, prices, uh, electricity prices, and, and putting this burden on on investors. Uh, but okay, Bulgaria is not a representative of EU. Uh, in EU countries, you don't have political risks. In energy community member states, you have plenty of political risks. And this is why we need, next to all instruments that already exist in EU, and where also EBRD is very active, and thanks God, uh, also efficient in this, we need additional financial instrument, which would be called, let's say, uh, risk enhancement facility for energy community uh, member states. Um, and I hope that all this new attention, which is now given by Angela Merkel and EU towards uh, Southeastern Europe, will result in some improvements uh, in this uh, financial infrastructure which is needed to, to bring these countries closer to EU. Um, about details, you can read on our webpage. <laughs> Uh, so, we are really pressed by time, uh, so uh, I, I hope the organizers will allow us to take a few more questions and after that just one round and then the panelists could answer. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Pantic, uh, I'm from Belgrade, uh, I'm running a public sector consulting company. So we are mainly executing diverse technical assistance projects funded by EU EBRD and others. Uh, but I wanted to comment a little bit on the policy side, um, and that, uh, that I think, and that's, that's visible at, at BLED Summit, uh, BLED Strategic Forum, through years, that the level of trust among countries, former Yugoslavia, is increasing. You know, you can feel it, yeah? So, uh, and that there is a certain sobering effect that today, uh, 2014, we are all aware that, you know, at the national level, the countries are really too small uh, and that we have to work together. But uh, what is really missing uh, is uh, great respect for each other in terms of each other's needs. You know, one country will say, well, we need uh, this highway, the other needs the other highway, this route and that route, etc. Uh, so, like, we have energy community. I think this should be expanded, yeah. I think we need the infrastructure community for the region, former Yugoslavia, basically. It's not Southeast Europe. Southeast Europe is a wider term. Maybe it could be Southeast Europe as well, you know, like it was under the Stability Pact, yeah. Um, could you please ask a question? Because we yeah, are no, I just wanted to comment. So, so uh, the question would be whether uh, anyone envisages something like this, uh, having such an infrastructure community, for policy coordination purposes, instead of uh, treating uh, as a historic landmark uh, meeting in Berlin with Miss Merkel, and you know, can we have a structure for this? Uh, 
let me. Yes, uh, sorry, please uh, really be con uh, concise and short because. I will uh, be very short and very, I hope, concise. Uh, congratulate for your comments and whatever you. But I feel sorry we didn't discuss more how to encourage other way of cooperation in the region. We were, you were talking mainly about the infrastructure projects, which are mainly, sorry, public sector or public finance. Uh, projects and I believe in this area we have plenty of small countries and we need if we want to gain some power in the world in this global economy we have to cooperate in the investment area in the I don't know not necessarily investing but working companies together in the automotive pharmace pharmaceutical many other areas tourism for example it's difficult to sell Slovenia, but it's easy to sell the whole region. So this is, I believe, maybe even easier way. But lately what we faced in Slovenia, a very hostile, let's say, uh, attitude towards some investors from the region in Slovenia. Why? We should cooperate and be more powerful in this very difficult global environment. Thank you very much. for. The Thank you very much. Um, I'm Stephanie Trubkova, corporate communications expert from Croatia. And uh, the quick comment is, on one hand, there is talk of integration, and uh, on the other hand, there are caustic remarks that actually promote mistrust and insecurity. Well, my question was actually for Mr. Richter, and it was regarding, yeah, but I hope one of you would answer it, is uh, regarding fracking as uh, a new method that he mentioned in the United States. I was just wondering what the role shell gas exploitation, uh, exploration has to play in Europe. Thank you. Yeah. So please, Sorry. perhaps I will, I will try. Well, fracking in Europe is not uh, a real uh, future. Perhaps in some smaller areas in Ukraine, Poland, somewhere uh, else, but not in, in, in major quantities. Uh, so this is unfortunately not our future. I, I, me as an a person from energy sector would wish to, to have it, but we, th there are no geological uh, uh, capability or possibilities. Uh, related to this uh, initiative about infrastructure uh, association, uh, I completely agree. I mean, uh, we have this SETSI, Southeastern European Transport Initiative, which is, which was in the in the beginning created exactly as energy community, but unfortunately stuck in a process of ratification because uh, Spain and some others were were again. Uh, so uh, energy community developed and is now becoming uh, starting to cover also um, some environmental issues, some. Uh, even some transportation issues, sets is somehow uh, stuck uh, in, in the process. Um, I believe uh, that European Union and its surrounding really needs a new pan-European uh, organization. Of course, I'm promoting energy community as a potential uh, seed for such an institution um, that would uh, uh, bring these neighborhood countries. I'm, I'm, talking about neighborhood, not about eastern neighborhood and Mediterranean neighborhood, but about, let's say, backyard of European Union uh, uh, in a more constant way. Because some countries like Georgia, for example, or Ar Algeria, or, or, I don't know, Egypt, will never become uh, uh, members of EU, but they have, somehow, they have to be brought uh, on board, um, because if if EU will not bring them on board, somebody else will. Turkey, Russia, I don't know, somebody, uh, a third uh, power. Uh, and this is why European Union has to invent a new, I'm promoting it as a so-called fourth uh, European community, uh, which would uh, bring these uh, backyard countries on board and tie them closer with European Union. Um, and I hope I will be successful with this uh, promotion of this idea of so-called fourth uh, European community, um, uh, which is already discussed as a so-called 
energy union, uh, but could be much wider also covering transportation issues and many other. Uh, but let's see uh, the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Kupac. Would okay, anyone maybe. would like to maybe add maybe just the answer maybe just the answer to Nena, to Nena. You know, we were both in July at one other forum also in Sautat, which was also let's say ex Yugoslavia forum somehow, and that's why I would uh, I am much more optimistic maybe than you are uh, after this forum because I saw that this consciousness is mature already, you know, that we have to uh, work more closer together. And I see already the light at the end of the tunnel. And also the last example, you know, when Agricor bought Mercator in Slovenia five years ago, it wouldn't be possible. Five years ago, we would, have, were, we would uh, be full of the prejudice, you know. I think that those prejudices now are, uh, are much more on the lower level than it would be five years ago. That's why I'm optimistic. Yeah, yes, we so. <laughs> Gentlemen in the okay. second row would like to add something or ask. Uh, my name is Gennady Cizik. I'm, I'm uh, represent the business from Ukraine. Uh, of course, I, uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, because it's 50% of this uh, event is focused on the Ukraine, of course, I'm a business person, I'm not uh, professional politics, that's why I'm no, I don't like to, to give this some my uh, vision about the future relation of Ukraine and Russia, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. But I will be quite practical on the practical question concerning the business. Uh, I heard I very attentive to everybody and uh, make a main uh, message. Everybody knows what will be with Europe and Ukraine in 10 years, but nobody say what will be with our relation with Russia in two months. Second, uh, I'm not agree with, with, from the business position. Uh, what the uh, price of gas is the only uh, commercial price. Uh, I give you an example. Uh, Ten years ago in Ukraine, the price was $50 per uh, cubic meter, 1,000 cubic meter. Now, practically 10 times more. Should me uh, show me the price of goods in the world where uh, during ten, uh, the years, 10 times more. Second, uh, when we talk about the sanction, I agree, sanction is not a business process. Business should be out, out of this. But I, I would like to uh, give the uh, concern in the uh, sanctions. You, you mentioned concern in the Mr. Councillor Brandt, the situation between uh, Euro uh, Europe and the Soviet Union. But remind me one uh, agreement what the Soviet Union destroyed uh, during uh, their period of communication with Europe. I give you only one example, was this, uh, uh, agreement was destroyed, or not uh, very polite to this, uh, the Budapest Agreement, where a very clear road, right, right. The uh, Ukrainian internity, it should be like, we have four countries who should protect the Ukrainian internity. Thank you. Uh, and final thanks. question, uh, crisis. Uh, I think when we talk about the crisis, crisis is a little bit personal point. But it's very difficult to say about the crisis. We've opened uh, uh, borders for uh, heavy weapons from uh, one country. Because I, I give you very interesting information. In Lugansk, in Donetsk, not walking the airport. Everything is... Understandable. Thank you very much. Uh, just two, two or three sentences, uh, Mr. Shkravets, after that. I said uh, that, that uh, just two sentences, yes. I think I will tell you what will be the relationship in two months, even worse than today. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you what will be in 10 years will be again good, unfortunately. We will have to go to the lots of disputes, conflicts, war, that we will be again friends. Unfortunately, we did in Yugoslavia the whole process, you know. That's the problem. Uh, dear panelists, uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, dear audience, I'm sure we discussed some points that could be also uh, debated further uh, during uh, the lunch. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.